Motion made by Coleman, properly seconded by Tio. Any discussion? All in favor of the said motion, let me say aye. aye. All opposed, like sign. And Ms. Coon, if you agree, please reflect in the minutes that do have a quorum present for the meeting. All right, there are no public comments. Uh, so at this time, we're going to invite uh, Peyton Davis uh, from Ruby Elementary School to come to the podium. He's going to lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, and then right before that, we are going to uh, have a moment of silence, and then I'll ask you to lead us in our pledge. Everybody stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you so much for that. We appreciate it. We welcome you to our meeting as well tonight, uh, Ms. Payton. All right, we'll take a few moments. We have a number of visitors with us tonight. We certainly want to welcome you to your board meeting. Uh, thank you for your attendance here. Uh, it always is a good feeling to look out and see people interested in educating the children of Chesterfield County. But a few folks I want to uh, recognize are SRO Perry. We certainly welcome you, and thank you for being here. I'm looking around. There we go. All right, good to see you with us uh, tonight. A teacher of the year, Jennifer Dillon. Good to see you with us, and we'll be talking with you in just a few moments, as a matter of fact. Uh, see several of our principals, several of our teachers, administrators, area citizens. We certainly welcome uh, each of you. Uh, I see our Schaeffler group. We certainly want to welcome you guys to our meeting tonight. Our new editor uh, of the Link newspaper, uh, Ms. Jacqueline Huff. We certainly welcome you to the uh, school board meeting uh, tonight, as well as our Bonds attorney having them with us as well. Certainly welcome each and every one of you out to the meeting uh, tonight. All right, board members, you've been given the minutes prior to the meeting. Hear no objection uh, to the minutes. They'll be deemed approved by consent, and it is done. All right, at this time we're ready for our special recognition, so this time we'll ask Dr. Anderson uh, to join us at the podium as we recognize a few folks tonight. Again, this is Ms. Jennifer Dillon, who is our District Teacher of the Year. Uh, Ms. Dillon is also the Teacher of the Year at Central High School, where she teaches, English Department Chair, 10th grade English teacher, um, teacher cadet student at Central, graduated from Central in 2001, came back in 2010, right? And for those who were here during our, during our opening day, she. Uh, did a great job being one of our speakers and just encouraging, inspiring all of the employees that we have present. So at this time, and we are very appreciative of Jostens, I want to present you with your District Teacher of the Year. Congratulations. Welcome, welcome. Right. At this time also, money's involved. It's a great thing. Money coming to us. We'll turn it to Dr. Hale. She's going to make a recognition. So before we get started with the presentation, I'd like to ask our chef of friends to come forward to the stage. Okay? So, good evening, Dr. Anderson, Mr. Chairman, and school board members. I am honored to stand before you this evening to acknowledge and express our deepest gratitude for the generous contribution of $10,000 from the Shepherd Group to our four high schools in Chesterfield County School District.
Shepherd's commitment to our schools actually goes beyond this monetary figure. I would like to commend Shepherd for their vision and commitment to our youth and the education of them. Um, so I wanted to introduce our Shepherd friends, and a couple of them will, or at least one, will say something at the end, okay? So step forward, or if you can, sort of, when I call your name, Ms. Trina Perry. She is the training specialist for Scheffler. Ms. Rose Vela. She is the manager of apprentice and technical training for the Americas region. Mr. Doug Nuttall, he is also a training specialist. Bill Sorrells, he is the apprenticeship advisor. Ms. Katie Reeves, HR manager. Alan Bailey, the plant manager. And Ryan Melton, the manufacturing planning manager. So welcome to all of you guys. So back in August of this year, it was actually Miss Perry, Miss Vella, and Mr. Nuttall and I spent a half day together touring some of the CTE programs in Chesterfield and Sherall. Sheffler's generosity sets a shining example for other businesses and industries in our community to follow. By supporting our schools, Sheffler is not only investing in our students, but also investing in the future prosperity and well-being of our community as a whole. So on behalf of the school board, the school district, the CTE instructors on the front second row, and more importantly, on behalf of our students, we have a couple of students with us today. They are Connor Russell and Garrett Ludlow, juniors from Sherall High. They're in these programs. And we extend our heartfelt gratitude to Scheffler for your generosity and commitment to our schools. We are eager to put these funds to good use and look forward to the positive impact they will have on the education and future of our students. And now I think Ryan Melton is going to say a few words. Just a Okay. okay, members of the board, members of Chesterfield County School District, and ladies and gentlemen, as Ms. Hale mentioned, uh, my name is Ryan Melton. I'm the Industrial en Engineering Manager for our Sherall 2 plant. Uh, with strong ties to Chesterfield County School District, I'm a 2005 graduate of Sherall High School. I see uh, Ms. Sharp there and some other um, uh, colleagues and teachers from my time, and also a proud spouse of a CCSD educator. Uh, so my wife was previously Chesterfield County School District Teacher of the Year. So I'm very proud that uh, Chesterfield County School District is ingrained in my life. So I'm proud to be here tonight for the announcement uh, uh, with this collaboration between CCSD and Scheffler. Uh, just to give you some very brief stats, according to the latest data from the National Center for Science and Engineering, nearly 35 million people in the American workforce are employed in STEM occupations. So right here in our county and community, we have a global organization employing over 1,500, 1500 individuals with links to STEM careers and occupations at Scheffler Group, or many of you may know us by our brand, previous brand name, Ena. Uh, so just a short overview about Scheffler, one of the world's largest family companies, Scheffler's global network of manufacturing locations, R&D facilities, and sales offices encompasses approximately 170 locations in over 50 countries. We have high precision products and system solutions and they're found in virtually any technological application from automotive drivetrains to high speed trains to wind turbines to production machinery to aircraft and everything in between. The school system, particularly Chesterfield County School District, plays a vital role in educating our future workforce. From operators to engineers to our functional managers, the job opportunities in STEM careers right here in our local community is vast and varied. So to help support the growth of the STEM education in our local community, the Scheffler Sherall campus wants to continue to build a bridge between education and industry, and we're very proud to present this $10,000 check to the Chesterfield County School District. So I'd first like to thank the Chesterfield or the Scheffler corporate team who made this possible. So the HR team and the training team that's really pushed us into this uh, pathway because it's critical to support the STEM education in our community. And then of course, I'd like to thank the Chesterfield County School District as we work together to uh, develop our workforce of the future. So as a uh, 
token of recognition, each high school in the district is going to receive a banner to highlight this collaboration and promote the STEM opportunities at Shuffler. And we also want to continue to build upon this bridge. So we want the guidance counselors in the high schools and also in the middle schools to work directly with us. Uh, we have an open door policy to introducing these engineering and STEM careers to our students. So please continue to work together with us and we look forward to collaborating with you in the future. So, instructors, students, I'd like you to come and stand in front of them. We're going to get your picture as well. Uh, so on behalf of the school board, we certainly want to thank you for that generous donation, um, just your commitment to our community. We've seen it uh, many years, uh, you know, with the employment of our community and, and now with the education of our kids and students and uh, the way you've supported our community college uh, as well. We certainly want to say thank you uh, from the board of uh, directors. And we will take a, a few minutes break before we go into our meeting uh, after our special recognitions in case some folks need to slip out. We certainly understand that. So we'll take about a three minute recess. And some board members may want to speak to Shapler as well, so we'll give you that opportunity.
Kentucky. Uh, he has several under him tonight, so we'll go ahead and call you to the podium for our September monthly review. Mr. Chairman, Dr. Anderson, members of the board, good evening. Uh, prior to this evening, you all received the September monthly financial review. Has any questions related to that review? Okay. Any questions, board members? I do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kessler, I noticed your report indicated uh, ideally at this time we'd be somewhere around 75 percent remaining in our budget. But I'm noticing there are several line items that are already 70, 80 percent, some at 100 percent. Could you explain the investment on uh, interest on investment was a negative 440 percent, and then? The staff uh, services was a negative 130 percent. Could you explain that? Yes, sir. Let me see. Make sure I'm finding where you are. Um, let me see. So the interest on investments at budgeted revenue, it's going to show negative. We get th those revenue numbers are actually flipped. That's actually a, a positive year-to-date revenue of $109,000. That $20,000 on that revenue line, interest on investments, mm -hmm. is that, that's that's based on some old uh, interest rates. Where interest rates have shot up so much. That's actually a, a positive revenue of 109,000 versus what we originally had in there of 20. So that's a, that's a good that's a good uh, variance there. And okay. What was, what was your other question? And the other one where we had uh, staff services is a negative 30 a negative 130 percent. Yes, sir. Let me make sure I'm in the right line here. Page four. Page four. So that staff service, that's related to um, some of the uh, bonuses that were paid out, the um, first year teacher bonuses, things like that, those are unbudgeted lines. Um, it's also related to some of the new software that was purchased that was unbudgeted, frontline central and frontline uh, absence management. Those things are all purchased at the beginning of the year, which is going to be front loaded right there at the beginning. Um, the staff services line is typically one that we do see go over budget pretty much every year because we have those unbudgeted items that are in there, but that, that's not that's not something that was unexpected, and that, that's not something that's going to continue to grow at that rate for the rest of the year. Those are items that have been expended in that first quarter, and they, they, won't, they won't continue. Okay, and then I'm looking at several other line items. I can't call them all. Somewhere at 90%, 97%, 84%, 75%, 81%. Yes, sir. Uh, and then again, your report indicating, you know, ideally was somewhere around 75%. So yes, some said several line items of exceed 75% already. Yes, sir. Uh, most of the time, when we're, when we're looking at that ideal remaining percent, it doesn't it doesn't take into account the, the timing. Our, this is just a percentage that our software throws on there based on the number of months that have passed throughout the year. Since we're one quarter through the year, as of se September, that's one quarter of your budget that should be gone. But because there's so many timing fluctuations, specifically at the beginning of the year related to purchasing software, prepaid items, things that you know you buy once at the beginning of the year and you don't buy them again for the rest of the year, that first quarter can get expensive as related to that percentage. And that's why you're seeing some of those that drop below 75. Towards the end of the year, you'll see that number creep closer and closer to what it actually is. The, uh, the times that we really start to get concerned about those uh, percentages being off is when it's related to salary and fringe items. Like if we say if we have a line that's that's way off on salary after the first quarter, we know that that's, that's an expenditure that's going to continue throughout the year. So that's where we get to, uh, get to be concerned as far as those percentages go. But those those lines don't don't relate to those salary items. We feel like we're right where we're supposed to be. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. All right. Thank, thank you so, you so much. much. Here none. We'll, we'll move on to the Pageland Impact. Page. I just want to call uh, Ms. Franny Heiser with our uh, bond attorneys for reform. Uh, she's going to talk about the payroll impact fees as well as the uh, penny sales tax. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, it's great to be with y'all. It's actually a beautiful day to drive up here from Columbia. It's looking like fall and actually starting to feel like fall. So uh, I am delighted to be here. Uh, on the impact fee issue, well, I wish I could give you a resounding pep talk about how good impact fees are and what they can do for y'all. Um, the reality is that the state legislature expects a lot from the school districts, but doesn't give y'all all of the tools that you may need to perform the way they expect. And two examples of that, one would be a multi-county industrial park where a school district doesn't really have a role to play. 
And the second example would be impact fees, where only counties and municipalities, cities and counties, are the only two levels of government authorized to impose impact fees. And there was a change in the law that made it clear that school facilities are a legitimate um, source for impact fees. So it is possible for an impact fee that is imposed by a city or a county to cover school facilities. So a few years ago, there was even a question about whether impact fees could be used for schools at all. But that question has been answered by the legislature. So yes, a school facility is a, a facility that can be used to justify an impact fee. However, it is a city, a town, or a county that has to impose that impact fee. School district cannot do it. So for the areas of Chesterfield County growing the most, I understand that is around Pageland, um, the step would be for the school district to officially approach Pageland and gauge the willingness of that governing body to impose an impact fee on behalf of the school district. Now we know that the city of Pageland has already imposed their impact fees for fire, parks, police. They have a separate um, impact fee, I think, for water and sewer. So those are the areas that Pageland has covered for itself. And so the question to ask of them is, are they willing to consider imposition of an impact fee that would benefit the school district. Now, part of the, the legislation that, that, that authorized school facilities also set up a, a multi-step procedure, and an important part of that procedure is there has to be a third-party study conducted to, to identify the appropriate amount of what an impact fee should or could be for a given service. And so that impact fee study would be required before an impact fee could be imposed by Pageland for the school district. And it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg that, that you don't know how much impact fee the study might, might suggest. And so do you go to Pageland first without knowing the amount that you may, ask, may want to ask for, or do you perform the study first? The impact fee study about a, some months ago, we had an estimate of maybe $25,000 would be the cost of that study. There seems to be, there is one firm that does most of, if not all of these impact fee studies in South Carolina. And the fact that they're already familiar with many aspects may allow the, the cost of that, that study to be less. Also, the, the principals in that firm uh, I think would be willing to visit with the school administration and have a talk. The, um, they would, I think, like to do that in connection with another trip down here. So it's not too late for Pageland to impose an impact fee, particularly for that larger project that's coming. But the, the question would be their political will to impose the fee and how much the fee would be. And, and those are two, um, two questions that the next steps would be to get answers to those two questions. Any questions for board members? For her? Ms. Birch? Ms. Birch. Bethesda, Maryland. Chisler. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes, sir, some have. Um, York County, um, the Fort Mill School District in particular, probably has the highest um, impact fee available for school districts. Uh, Fort Mill is is a very rapidly growing area where the, the cost of the land, the cost of housing, and the cost of new construction for schools um, has all um, um, 
places those impact fee numbers pretty high for, for uh, Fort Mill. The, the York County imposes that impact fee on behalf of the, the Fort Mill School District. Other school districts in, Fort, in, in York have not had the same success and different, different parts of that county are growing or not growing at different, um, different degrees and I, I think that politics has a role to play in the imposition of these impact fees. So York County is certainly probably one of the best examples with Fort Mill being, being the top. Down in um, Dorchester County, Somerville um, has a successful impact fee, although there has been litigation over both that fee and the Fort Mill fee. So there's no easy road once you start having developers paying twelve, fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars per per rooftop, the developers um, um, fight that they, they think it's it's bad for their business. I can tell you in Beaufort County, uh, Beaufort County Council approved an impact fee for the school district in Beaufort. They had started to collect that fee and one of the major municipalities decided to um, to not impose an impact fee with its in within its municipal borders and the school district just said it's not worth it and they actually refunded the what they had collected so the experiences around the state are, are really very very checkered some are, some are successful many of them are not successful any other Yes, sir, and, and um, I, I think it's clear that, that if the information, the earlier the information is available, the, the better it is for the developer. Um, and in some instances, it's not just one developer. When you have an area growing rapidly like Bluffton or Fort Mill or I now even the area around Clover, um, you've got many different developers. Lancaster County up around the pan, Panhandle um, as it approaches, um, approaches North Carolina is more than one developer. So the issue is once you know the impact fee, it's for everybody, it's not just for a developer. If there's an impact fee, it's for everybody's rooftop. So everybody knows what the rules are. And on a going forward basis, I think that does make it easier. It certainly allows the developer to make a business decision about is it worth you know, taking down this property and trying to develop it when um, I know that just off the top, I'm gonna have to pay $10,000, say, uh, for a school impact fee. So it gives them more information. Any other questions? Any questions? Okay. okay. Thank you Thank so much. So we appreciate, appreciate it. it. So we'll go to the penny tax. Right That's right. Next? Yep, yep, yep. Next. Um, do y'all have as a handout the steps? Yes, ma'am. For uh, reimposing uh, the uh, sales tax. The, um, just by way of background, on sales tax. Yeah, we have it. Great. Okay. By, by way of background, your first sales tax for uh, school capital improvements was um, imposed and authorized by local legislation. There was a special piece of legislation that went through the legislature about, I think, 25 years ago. I think your, your sales tax has been in place for, for a many number of years. And around that time, there were a number of school districts that were able to have a referenda to approve a sales tax uh, based on local legislation. Well, in 2008, uh, the state law changed and what we call the Education Capital Improvements Sales Tax Act was passed. By way of history, it was passed because Horry County School District had a penny sales tax question on the ballot. Their county um, also had a penny sales tax question on the ballot. 
both of the questions one both of the questions were answered yes affirmatively by the by um, by the voters but the state supreme court overturned the results for Ori school district and state law basically said once your county's got a sales tax school district you can't have one also and Ori schools looking for a solution went to the legislature and got a, got the state law passed called the education capital improvement sales tax which does allow for a a school district to have a sales tax even in a situation where a county already has a sales tax that would be either the capital project sales tax or the transportation sales tax so you are no longer legally authorized to use local legislation for your sales tax you must go under the terms of this statewide law so the um, the first step really for any sales tax I think is to identify what your potential what your needs are what your projects are going to be you will need to identify the projects as part of the ballot question given to the voters on election day and so however y'all decide to do a facility study use your own um, maintenance folks to do inventories uh, you may already have the studies that suggest what you're going to need in your growth areas so y'all may have enough information to put your project list together if you don't feel like you have enough information or you want third-party um, verification or third-party input then that is the first step and and that's something that y'all should go ahead and, and start to acquire that service, identify how through whatever procurement might be necessary to bring in a company or service that would help y'all with your facility study and identify your list of potential projects. The ultimate decision about what projects will be included under the sales tax will be the school district. It will not the school district, I'm sorry, the school board. Your administration will recommend, but y'all are the ultimate decision makers about what's going to be um, um, listed on that ballot. We always recommend that you spend as much time as you can in discussions with your stakeholders, uh, talking to your community, uh, potentially doing research. Uh, it is certainly some school districts have, um, have really gone to the point of having surveys and polls conducted by professional pollsters, focus groups, um, or uh, we had one, Lancaster just recently had a survey that went out and was on the school website so that parents would be parent, easy for parents to, to, to respond to that. And, and don't forget about your students because they are your ultimate stakeholder. So the, the amount of time that, that y'all need to, to be reaching out is probably in the cold winter months and by the time you start to get to March, you, you probably should start to have a pretty good idea of what your community is thinking and feeling and um, it's probably time to start uh, getting numbers run by your financial advisor I think Bob Dameron from Compass Municipal works with y'all we know that, that your your sales tax is averaging about four and a half million um, which is a good uh, <clears throat> a very good steady stream of revenue and it is one that um, that you potentially would do what we call bond against. And so an, one decision for you, the school board, to make is whether or not a bond referendum separate question will be included with your tax question. So most school districts have a sales tax question that has a list of projects. And a, a second but companion question that's the bond question. It's, are we authorized to issue, in y'all's case, $84 million or $100 million or 50, or whatever the number would be. So you've got the bond referendum question and the list of projects are the same. So basically you're telling the voters that you're gonna use the sales tax to either pay debt service on this list of projects or use pay as you go um, through cash. And Mr. Dameron will be able to uh, at least estimate for y'all what amount you would need for debt service and how much you, how much you would have available for um, pay as you go. So once y'all's made those decisions, uh, we draft a resolution 
that um, calls for either or both, well, calls for the sales tax question or calls for both. Um, the, the timing on that is really up to y'all with the, the one hard number or hard date being the, um, the resolution ordering the referendum has to be to your local election commission by noon on August the 15th. That is state law, there's no wiggle room, and so all of the work that you want to have done uh, or want to accomplish, including adopting the resolution, needs to happen before August 15th. Now, until y'all have voted on whether to have a referendum or not, um, you are free to spend public resources on research, even on ad advocacy. After you have taken that vote, the uh, State Ethics Act starts to come into the picture and would apply to, um, to all the efforts. And the basic rule is that you cannot use public resources to advocate for the outcome of an election. You can use resources to educate, but not advocate. And we have a presentation on do's and don'ts, and we work with a number of school districts, and uh, Dr. Anderson will have me on speed dial, and, and we, we, will, we will make sure that we stay on the, on the right side of, of that rule um, about advocacy versus education. So really, the, the, the work now is identifying what the projects would be and, um, and the various amounts that, that y'all might be looking at. Under the, this sales tax act, you can, um, the sales tax can, can apply for only 15 years, so your window is less than 15, or less than your former sales tax. Mm -hmm. And you actually can agree, if you choose, you can share your sales tax with institutions of higher education, public institutions in the county. A, a tech college, for example, and if you go back in history with Ori, remember this all started with Ori. Ori wanted to be able to share its sales tax with Coastal Carolina and Ori Georgetown Tech. Now, Ori gets like $60 million a year, and so sharing 15% of $60 million still you know, gives that school district plenty, plenty of resources. But that is, is, is a possibility. But for the mere mortal school districts who don't get that much, when you start to share four and a half million dollars, it really does start to, to cut into your buying power and the amount. But that is part of the act, and so I wanted to be sure to mention that to you. Okay, any questions, questions. from board members? All right, well, lots, lots of good of information. information. We certainly well, appreciate you it. Anything you need, just let us know. and. Um, we look forward to, to helping y'all. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate, appreciate it. it. And if I don't think I've got anything else on the agenda, your meeting is going very rapidly. So I think I'm going to tiptoe out if that's okay with That's you fine. Also. That's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. So Drive safe. safe. All right. At this time, we'll call on our Chief of Personnel, Dr. Hazard, for our personnel report. Dr. Anderson, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, at this time I would like to recommend the following exhibits for your approval, exhibits A through C. Second. Motion made by Mr. Sweeney, properly seconded by Mr. Coleman. Any discussion? All in favor of the said motion, let me know by saying aye. All opposed, nay. And it is unanimous. All right, thank you. All right, at this time we'll call on our Chief of Academics, Ms. Stubbs, for our curriculum report and also our 2023 SC report cards. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Anderson, and members of the board. Um, there are several items from the uh, curriculum report that I would like to highlight. Um, the first of these is the report card ratings, and we'll go into that in just a moment um, in, in, in depth. Um, but the first of these is the federal programs, some of the things that are going on with federal, federal programs. Um, on October 9th, which is what we call our OEC day, the Multilingual Learner Conference um, was held in Clover, and two of our ML teachers presented at the Parent University. Parent University is a program to help parents of multilingual learner students navigate the school system. 
Um, in addition, we had 44 ML teachers also attended um, the WIDA National Conference in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and those teachers brought back lots of information to share with their schools. Federal programs also held um, training for our principals and points of contact um, on McKinney Vento, and McKinney Vento is, um, is, is a way that we, um, as a school district, um, address um, students that may have, um, that may lack a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence. And so um, we've got to make sure that we identify those students um, and provide them the resources that they need. Um, visual and performing arts, um, Ms. Hannah McGuire has worked hard with um, our visual and performing arts. Um, one of the things that she has done is that she has provided training to our literacy coaches on ways that um, we can integrate arts into the regular curriculum. I mean, there's a lot of research behind that about how it's so important that music and, um, and art be infused in our curriculum. Congratulations um, goes to all of our high school bands for, um, for qualifying for the South Carolina Band Directors Association Marching Band State Championship on October 28th. Um, and so a shout out to all of our bands. Um, and in addition, our bands performed on Friday um, at the Veterans Day Parade in Chesterfield. So it was exciting to see, see those, those folks out. Um, we have nominations for our Alpha program. It's going on this month, and students can be nominated um, by their teachers or by parents, or even they can nominate themselves. And last is um, our 10th and 11th grade junior scholars um, visited USC Lancaster on October 19th. Um, the students were welcomed by the dean and then had a tour of the, the campus and um, just had a great time. I think we included some pictures from that event for, for all of you. Any questions about the curriculum report before we go into the, the presentation for um, our report card ratings? Okay, we do have one, Mr. Yes. Coleman. Uh, looking at you. That is correct. Yes, they will be doing a they will be doing a um, plan as well. Um, the one for Jefferson will will be presented to the board in December for your approval before it goes to the state department. Okay. okay. All right, so um, uh, while she's pulling that up, while, while Nicole is pulling that up for us, just as some background, um, the South Carolina Accountability System um, was, was passed in 1998, okay? And it provides the foundation and requirements for the South Carolina Accountability System for all public schools. Um, of course, the goal of this accountability system is to improve teaching and learning. Um, so that all students are equipped with a strong academic foundation um, and, of course, to ensure that students graduate with the world-class knowledge and skills and characteristics of the profile of the South Carolina graduate. All right, so um, the first slide shows us the areas that are reported each year for our elementary and middle schools. Um, all of our schools receive a rating except for primary schools. There is information that is reported um, on students that are on track for success, but they do not receive a report card rating, okay? Um, so it's just for our schools that have that state testing, okay? So one of the things is, is the academic achievement. How well do the students perform overall on SC Ready? And that's in grades three through eight. Um, another part of the report card is the preparing for success, and that is part of that's how students do on the fourth grade and sixth grade science. Those are the only two grades that are tested, um, assessed with SC Red. Okay. Then we look at stu the, they look at student growth. How well do our students perform from one year to the next? Okay. They they get points on that. Um, and then there is a school climate survey. 
Um, teachers do a, do a survey and that is reported to the state and points are, giving, are given to the schools with the climate survey. Um, if there is a subgroup um, more, of more than 20 students at a school of multilingual learners, then that is part of that report card as well, okay? Um, so, so we have that for some of, some of our schools, but not for all. So those are the areas, okay? For high schools, academic achievement is your English 2 and Algebra 2. You're preparing for success um, is your EOC scores from Biology 1 and U.S. History. Um, graduation rate, um, and again, that was from those students that were from the 2019-20 school year, um, okay? There is also college and career readiness, which is based on um, how students do on SAT, ACT, um, CT, CTE completer, work-based learning, um, and several other items. Again, they have a school climate, and then the English learner, learner's progress, um, students that are making progress towards being English proficient in English. Okay, so that's what's reported for high school. All right, so here's where we, are, where we stand. This is from 2019 to 2000, 2023. Um, now, you can see in 2019 that was pre-COVID, okay? Then COVID hit. And you can see that from 2019 to 2022, we had a dip. Um, and, and we know that because we had inconsistent um, schooling, um, students were on an A-B schedule, students and teachers were sick, and so there was just so many factors that played into that. Um, and then of course this is um, 2023, and you can see that anywhere there is a star, we're making a, um, an upward trend, okay? So we're, we're rebounding from those from those COVID years. Um, so as you can see, we have um, you know, a school that went from below average to average, from average to good, and so on. And those are our elementary schools. That's how we look there. Um, the next slide is our middle schools. Um, and, and middle schools, again, um, some kind of maintained, and then we had an upward trend, up, upward trend with new heights. Um, and Chesterfield Ruby Middle. And then finally for our high schools, um, here's where we are with high schools. Um, so you can look at those um, as well. So um, some of the things that we are doing um, as a district um, to ensure the success of all students, um, and this is district-wide, um, so we're looking at progress monitoring our schools every month. Um, Jefferson and Central are working on the turnaround plans and, and of course we're gonna show that to you um, in December. Um, we had our schools working on uh, school renewal plans and aligning those with professional development. Um, we've had stakeholder meetings at all of our schools to talk to parents and community members about the report card ratings and what they mean. Um, we have some great intervention models at our elementary and middle schools that we have the data to show that that's working. After school tutoring, uh, we're looking at our classroom walkthrough data. We've seen a de decrease in discipline referrals and lots of family engagement initiatives. Um, we know that that's really important to have that, um, that parent and community involvement. Um, and then to continue on, um, certainly an increase in our communication with stakeholders, um, professional development in math, and, and you know, during COVID, we, you know, we really thought that, that ELA was gonna get hit hard, but actually it was math. Um, and so we really got to make a push for, um, for math. Um, at all of our elementary schools, we're partnering with the State Department to have letters training, which stands for Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. Um, we've got an additional reading recovery teacher leader, um, data meetings and leadership meetings happening at our schools. We're utilizing IXL as a developmental, I mean, excuse me, as a supplemental resource. Um, we're being very proactive with our intercession weeks and making that very intentional um, based on what kids need. And our summer camp, um, we've expanded that um, to include grades 4K through 8th grade. 
um, you know, and the state is only paying for those, those students at that third grade level that were does not meet on SC Ready, but we've included uh, multiple grades with that. So those are just some of the things that are going on in our district um, to ensure the success of all students. So that was a lot in just a short period, but do you have any questions, any concerns, any suggestions? Okay, Mr. Sams. I've got one question. Um, I didn't see it mentioned here. The elevator program after nine weeks, how is, how is that? How, how was it expected out of that? Um, well, we have made a lot of progress with, you're talking about the, the elevated, the uh, new heights. Yeah, and so, yes. Um, so there's there's been some, um, uh, progress monitoring there, um, looking at where our students are. Um, it's there were some some glitches at the beginning, but a lot of that has been has smoothed out, um, and so you know it, it's going well. Any other questions? Okay, Mr. Sweeney, catch you next month, right? <laughs> Do you have a question, Mr. Sweeney? <laughs> Okay, all right. Dr. Anderson? I do want to say that, you know, you saw the report card rating, you saw what was done last year, previous year, year before that. But you also saw the action steps so we can continue to ensure academic success. It's a lot of work. You, I mean, you all know that as a board. It's a lot of work. Our employees, our parents as a whole, I'm speaking about, I'm speaking in reference to the body work has been absolutely <coughs> wonderful. And the reason I'm saying that is because the stakes and the, and the, the standard of measurements, they go up each year. It doesn't, it doesn't remain the same. So what we, do, what we did last year, we can't do the next year. We have a lot of work to do, but Lord knows we've done a lot of work. And I just want to commend all of our district staff, all of our principals that are sitting here, APs, teachers, bus drivers, school service workers. It's, it's an all hands on deck affair every single day. That's how it gets done. So I want to commend them openly. Um, and for those who are listening, parents who are out there, it can't happen without our parents. It's, it's an all hands on deck affair. This is what it's about. This is the work of education and we're gonna keep pushing. All right, all right. thank, thank you. you. Um, Mr. Coleman, I'm sorry. With that in mind, Dr. Anderson, and, and I don't, you don't have to respond to it right now, but I noticed when you gave the report card, how Mac we maintained that consistency through COVID, good, 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 AAA. I mean, what is Mac be doing so different? <laughs> just, just, just you don't have to ask them tonight. I just noticed that they, they were consistent all the way through. Um, would, would you and say and I think you know probably the, the principals could answer this. You know uh, what they what they've been doing at their schools. But one thing is really really looking at those digging down into those standards and aligning those standards to instruction and making sure that the assessment is matching. Um, and I'm talking about the assessment at the school is matching what the assessment um, looks like on SC Ready. So um, you know we're, we're doing some of those set trying yeah. you know doing some of those same things district wide as far as looking at pacing guides and assessment and standards alignment. Thank you. I'm, I'm paying back, back to Dr. Anderson. To add on to your question, you said the word in there, consistency. Being consistent, being intentional, and you know, again, our school leaders out there, you know, who are sitting right in front of us, you know, getting in those classrooms. Teachers, listen, we build quality teachers for, for quality instruction. It doesn't just happen. You know, when we have our principals at operating as instructional leaders, that that's I'm telling you, that's where it begins. You know, when we have our assistant principals helping to operate and helping to manage and lead when it comes down to student discipline, just as important. So it's not there's not one particular thing. It's a combination of intentional steps and actions that we have to make sure that we're it's taking place every single day. And, and it's always moving. You know, it, it's always moving. So uh, Mackie did a great job. You know, here's, here's one thing we have to understand sure. about the state report card. The state report card, yes, it assesses all of our students throughout the state. But the report, at the end of the day, it, the, the score or the rating comes from how the school did not with other schools, with itself, the, pri the prior year. 
So, so basically, we're trying to outdo what we did last year. That's how we move forward on that report card. And if I'm not mistaken, some of the some of the formulas that's used on the state report card, they're about to change, and they change every so often. That's that's correct. Wow. You know, so, you know, that that's that's the that's the political climate that we're in. Um, you know, we can complain about it, but at the end of the day, we got to get it done. So, but wonderful job. All right, thank you. And we certainly do want to thank our staff and, and Courtney, all of you for what you do and um, each and every day. We certainly thank uh, each one of you. Uh, at this time, we'll turn it over to Dr. Anderson. Thank you. So Dr. King is actually going to uh, make a presentation. trying to tackle the same issue of Bacon. So we we'll turn it over to Dr. King and let him do what he does. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Board Chairman and Dr. Anderson and the board members. Um, so just wanted to talk about, you know, just what Dr. Anderson had mentioned, uh, first quarter student services report. You should have these um, in your packets, but just kind of looking at what we dealt with from the high school level, talk about high school first. Looking at our first quarter reports with fights, uh, we had a total of reported 21 fights at the high school level. Um, and if you look at the vaping, we had 65 reports of vaping. Disrespect, we had 44. Bullying, one, and dress code, three. Talking about violations as a whole. Um, and you can see the breakdown. I'm not gonna get into the details, but you can see the breakdown with male and female, race, you know, all those that were reported for the first quarter for high school. So just keep those numbers in mind and I'll, I'll bring them back up as we get further into this presentation. At the middle school level, we had a total of 15 reported fights. Uh, vaping, we had 23 reported incidents. Disrespect, 40. Bullying, two, and dress code. Just allow me to let, let, let the number sink in a little bit. All right, so the high school infractions that resulted in suspension with the fights was 20. Vaping was 65. The disrespect was a total of 17. And bullying and dress codes, neither one resulted in OSS or suspensions. At this is the high school level. At the middle school level, we had 14 fights that resulted in suspensions. Vaping, 22. Disrespect was nine. And of course, with bullying and dress codes, none resulted in suspension. So one of the things that I want to highlight with the student vaping, 64% of our high school suspensions in the first quarter was due to vaping. And 49% of our middle school suspensions in the first quarter were due to vaping. So we have taken active steps to combat the growing use of vaping in our school. And we know these are not perfect fixes, but we're trying to address the issues that we're dealing with in vaping. So we have, we've already ordered additional metal detectors that are still en route. Those metal detectors can be set to detect vaping devices. Um, and also with that in mind, 
Vapes come in so many different shapes and sizes now. And so they're easy to conceal because they're small and slender. Um, some even look like pins. Some look like highlighters, some look like markers, it just depends. Um, so with that in mind, we are in the process of purchasing vape detectors. Vape detectors, they uh, rely on, like the, the sensors eliminate the need to see the device. So relying instead on the ability to, de to detect vapors in the air. That's what the vapor detectors would do. And also, too, because the education piece is the piece that we leave out multiple times when it comes to students and parents. Um, educating students and parents is important with the dangers of vaping. And it's important because there is concern of how it, the drugs actually impact the kids' brains, specifically the potential uh, for cognitive and behavioral impairments and respiratory harm. So a lot of our students think vaping is harmless um, than cigarettes, but it is more research. As more research comes out, you see it's becoming more clear that vaping is very dangerous for adolescents. So our current student handbook, this is what our policy currently states. It's category 25, uh, category three offense, possession or use of tobacco products or related paraphernalia. Lighters, matches, rolling paper, etc. So those are, um, and so the vaping or the e-cigarettes are not included in this particular policy, unless you want to include it in the etc. part. Um, but if you look at our current policy or our process, first offense, three days out of school suspension. Second offense, five days out of school suspension and referral for pre expulsion hearing. Third offense, students will be assigned five to ten days out of school suspension and recommendation for exposure. That's currently in our policy. The recommended new vaping procedure for middle and high school says the first offense, which is still three days out of school suspension, but first time violators of smoking and smoking paraphernalia then uh, are required to complete a course sponsored by the school district scoring at least 80% on the assessment at the end of the course. So this gets back to educating the kids, not just putting them out, but explaining, we're gonna put them out still, but explaining why they don't need to do these things. Second offense, five days out of school suspension. Um, and students will also be required to attend one day of Saturday school with a required course for substance use and misuse prevention in lieu of an expulsion hearing. And the third offense, <clears throat> recommendation for a pre-expulsion meeting with the hearing officer to discuss counseling options for student in lieu of expulsion. Students will be suspended pending a pre-expulsion hearing. Once again, this is more educating, continually trying to educate our kids on why we don't want them to do it. And of course, the fourth offense, once it gets to that point, is recommended for expulsion. So I'm addressing the babies. I hate to do it, but they're included as well. So currently in our handbook for K-5, um, not just the three five, but it's K-5, um, first offense, one day out of school suspension, second offense, three days out of school suspension, third offense, five days out of school suspension. The proposed one, first offense, parent conference with administration before the student can return to school. Days missed will count as an unexcused absence. At that particular level, that's the responsibility. A lot of responsibility falls on the parent. Second offense, one day out of school suspension, parent conference required before the student can return to school. Days missed will count as an unexcused absence. Now, when you're looking at testing or having to pass a test at the first grade, second grade level, we're not going to have to make that a requirement for those younger ones, but it's more so educating on the parent side. Third offense, three days out of school suspension. Fourth offense, up to five days out of school suspension. Also, we're going to look at group activity with vaping. It will be investigated and punishment will be determined at the conclusion of the investigation. One thing I want to note as well before I get to this particular question part. One of the things that, that we're proposing for the 2024-2025 Chesapeake County School District Handbook timeline, just to give you an idea of what we're working with, 
In January, we're going to establish a stakeholder group to discuss updates and revisions to our handbook. Now, this stakeholder group can consi will consist of administrators, teachers, parents, and high school student government representatives, as well as district leaders. So we're going to bring everybody to the table, all stakeholders. So just to give you a timeline, so February to March, we're going to meet with these stakeholders groups, and we're going to hash out looking at our handbook from top to bottom or the adjustments that we need to make in additions or the things that we need to take away that are outdated. And in April, the plan is to return to the board to present the recommendations for the 2024-2025 student handbook. So you all will have an update, we gave you the process of what we're gonna go by and you'll have an update at our April board meeting. All right. So this will not be a policy change, <clears throat> so it does not require two readings, but we will, we're going to vote to go ahead and make this change to the uh, handbook, uh, and then he's going to put this timeline in place. So this time I entertain a motion uh, to change the handbook based on the presentation that was just presented by Dr. King. Okay, the motion has been made by Sweeney and properly seconded by Ms. Birch. Any discussion? Do you all have a discussion on it? Any questions? Okay, here... No Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Uh, all in favor of the said motion, let me know by saying aye. All opposed, nay. And it is unanimous. Thank you. Oh, thank you. We do appreciate the hard work you've, you've done on that. And we do know this is happening in districts throughout the nation. It's yes, not sir. just Chesterfield County. Uh, it's sad. And I think the education piece, I like that a lot. I don't know who came up with it. Um, could have been through the state. I don't know. But it's actually certainly... Uh, a good piece to add to to that policy is that education part of it as well. I will take the credit for that. Okay. Well, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. All right, Dr. Anderson, we'll let you continue. All right, certainly we appreciate that. All right, board members, we have our SCSBA legislative uh, meeting uh, December the 2nd and 3rd in Charleston, so I'll remind you uh, of that as well. And I think Dr. Anderson has one more thing. I just remembered. Thank you all. Yeah, I want to thank, yeah. Yeah, want to thank uh, the board uh, for moving forward with uh, the, the holiday bonus for our employees. 
part-time employees, that's in previous years, part-time employees who receive $300 in, uh, uh, holiday incentive or bonus, and our full-time employees, $500. Um, we want to make sure this year, and in previous years, you know, we did it. Year before last, we, our employees actually received that incentive in January. Last year, it was during the Christmas um, holiday break. This year, we want to make sure that we're working towards getting that to our employees before Thanksgiving. So, again, thank you all for uh, pushing forward and for approving it. All right, thank you. All right, so we we have a petition uh, for annexation uh, from the town of Chesterfield. I think we have a picture of the map possibly to come up. We were really late getting that um, for you to put up, um, Ms. Gulledge. Did you get it? There's a little piece of property beside Chester High School that we purchased a few years ago. Uh, it's actually a parking lot um, for the baseball team and softball team. Uh, that piece of property sits in the county. Uh, so the problem is when cars park over there and any of them are vandalized and those type of things, that's the only piece of property that the county, the sheriff's department, would actually come and investigate on. So we're going to annex that, um, bring that into the town and get you guys to annex that into the town. Uh, after this vote tonight, but I want to explain to the public exactly what we were doing. Uh, so th that's the only real change that happens with that piece of property is it's no longer uh, county, but it will be annexed into uh, the town, as is the rest of Chesterfield High School. So I will entertain a motion uh, to go forward with the annexation of that piece of property. Mr. Chairman, I move that we annex the property to the town of Chesterfield. Second. The motion made properly seconded by Teal. Any discussion? All in favor of the said motion, let me know I'm saying aye. aye. All opposed, nay. And it is unanimous. All right. Also, uh, board members, you have before you a uh, Chesterfield Advisory Council appointment, uh, Barry Waddell. Uh, we're going to bring him on to the Chesterfield County Advisory Board. So at this time, I'll entertain a motion to do that. Motion made by Sims. Second. Seconded by Coleman. Any discussion? All in favor of the said motion, let me know I'm saying aye. aye. All opposed, nay. And it is unanimous. Uh, board members have the SESBA annual conference uh, going on February the 15th. Uh, and Ms. Coon needs to know by December the 5th if you're planning on going to Hilton Head to attend. So if you would, please make sure you get with her and let her know uh, that you plan on attending. Uh, our Christmas meeting. Uh, will be December the 11th, uh, which we'll have our Christmas dinner as well. Um, December the 11th here at the Paramount Learning Center at 5.30. Uh, the executive session will start at 5. Also, I did not see her come in, but I want to also welcome Miss Jane Pig, the owner of WCRE and The Link. Uh, we welcomed your new editor with us tonight, but I see you back there and certainly want to welcome you. And thank you for the coverage and all that you do for Chesterfield County School District. All right, so at this time I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion been made by Coleman, properly seconded by Birch. Any discussion? All in favor of said motion, let me know I'm saying aye. aye. All opposed, nay. And it is unanimous. All right, a little bit longer meeting tonight, but we certainly appreciate your patience and everything that you've done for us. Thank you.